Welcome back everybody. Let's get to it. Now to bring you up to speed on the repair plan for the torched out holes in each side of the 10x casting. You can see where we've got this slaggy looking stuff from the heat from torching. So with cast iron, anytime you locally heat it to the point where you can melt the metal, it changes the molecules in the cast and like all of these um, bubble looking pieces right here, they get so hard, they could be as hard as a drill bit. So that means you can't drill these, you can't file these, you can only grind them away to get back down to good metal that you can actually work with. So that's what I've already done on this side. We've cleaned it up, rounded it out, and we've got all that hard stuff out of the way so we can actually work it. And another factor with dealing with cast iron, so I am not going to try to braze or weld this because I don't have a way to, in a controlled manner, bring the entire piece up to a proper temp, do the repair, and then cool the whole thing down in a controlled manner. That's the number one place that people go wrong when they're trying to perform cast iron repairs. And welding, you to do it properly, you need to get it really up there in heat. Um, I'm no expert, but I think it's north of like a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Brazing, you only have to preheat, well, maybe two thirds of that because brazing just you know requires a lot less heat in general. But doing that, it does not change any of the molecular structure of the cast iron. You can see if you don't do proper preheats and post heats, we've got a crack just from the torching that happened that goes down to about there. We've got a second crack that bridges into that factory drilling where they provided access for that roll pin. And there are a couple other smaller ones that radiate off of this one. This side was the same way, but for our cold repair, our metal stitching that we're going to do, they are not going to pose any problems. Now, to plug that hole. You're not going to believe where I sourced my material. This is a cast iron Caterpillar 10 dash. It was broken well beyond repair when I got it. Somebody's torched holes in it. Again, you can see all the cracks that happened from putting that much heat in a piece of cast iron. You just, you can't do that. But this was a piece that was in one of my buddy's scrap piles and he let me take it because I wanted some donor material for cast iron repairs. So. This was the perfect candidate. I cut this bottom corner out right here and salvaged a piece of it that I made to fit that opening almost perfectly. So we have an excellent surface finish match between the Minneapolis Moline iron and the Caterpillar iron. Now some of you may be crying foul on this. Case rested. So to explain the process, metal stitching has literally been around for a hundred years. It's nothing new. In a nutshell, I'm going to drill a hole, half on the patch piece, half on the parent piece, thread that hole, and then run a screw down into it, tighten it in, flush the head of it off with the surface, and then drill another hole down the side of the one I just put in, thread that, put a screw in, and you just keep lapping like that until you're all the way around and that creates a permanent bond between both pieces of metal. Nothing is coming apart at that stage. Our modern methods, well, they've been refined quite a bit over what it originally was, but lock and stitch is probably the most popular premier method of doing this and we're just doing the stitch portion. We're not worrying about locks. That's a story for another time, but here's some lock and stitch screws here. They make them in all different sizes, different materials, and you can see how just below the head, it's scored all the way around. That is intentional, okay? So with a lock and stitch screw, you run it in until it tightens itself in, and then this is meant to twist off right there, leaving a flush surface and a permanent installation. Lock and stitch is so popular because, well, they do it a lot differently. So a standard thread on a screw looks like the top of a triangle, all right? They're equal angles up and back down again, up and back down. The problem with that in a stitching application is when you run that standard thread pitch down in and get it tight, it wants to push the surrounding metal away from the screw because it's like a ramp right here. Everything wants to go basically downhill and away, all right? The lock and stitch screws have a special thread, so they actually angle up and then do a more gradual taper back down so that when these are tightened 
fully down in, it's like they're grabbing onto the surrounding material and pulling it in closer to themselves because again, we want to go downhill and downhill happens to be pulling in toward the center of that screw. So with lock and stitch screws, the screws are expensive. The taps are expensive because it's all proprietary thread. Everything is specialized, all right? I'm not going that route because we're not in an application where we would need to have the screws grabbing onto the metal and pulling it in. We can deal with it wanting to push the metal out because if we were just dealing with a straight line crack, we don't want to exert pressure out on that to risk moving it any further than you know what it already has gone. So in the typical lock and stitch method, you'd start with the first hole, sink the screw into it, and then you would like half to a third lap the next one over that, lap the next and the next, and you just keep going on down the line till you've basically filled that entire crack in. What we're gonna do right here, because we have the advantage of having a round, fully closed in hole, we are just going to barely lap these screws over one another and we're using just a standard thread pitch screw because they don't have to be that tight and we are not trying to hold anything in and we're not trying to keep anything out this is an open air compartment okay we don't have to worry about leaks anything like that we're just doing a cosmetic repair and it doesn't really even have to be that structural nothing is really depending on this we just need to get that hole filled and try and make it look like nothing ever happened Don't mind the vacuum, it's fine, probably. So we've got the first hole drilled and I'm starting out just with the cordless drill because yeah, we've got three clamps holding everything in place and the drill press is not going to fit without hitting those. But um, everything's looking pretty good right here. We are flushed out well, I'm liking that. And you can see where our joint line comes around and right through the middle of the hole, that's exactly what I wanted. And there we've got our threads. Now the first screw. These are one quarter by 20 thread also. Second screw going in. This is when the patch starts getting a lot more stable. Number three. And number four. That patch is not going to go anywhere now. Solid. Okay everybody, catch you all up on what has happened. Since I last had the camera on, I did take all four of the initial screws back out one at a time and applied Loctite to the threads. I wanted to hold off on that step until I had our patch positioned and I knew nothing else was going to move after that. So I've drilled another hole now. This is the stitching portion of it. We're going to see if we can uh, give you all a view here. Let's try some light. So we've got threads that are cut just down the side of the stitch screw that's right next to the hole so that when the next screw goes in, the threads on each will be commingled a bit and it will essentially lock the two of them together so that nothing can uh, turn or spin or move after that. So we'll just keep going with it. Same deal, lock tight on this screw as well.
Now we'll do another one right alongside that. And the last one. All right, quick catch up on what's happened so far. I ended up sinking 19 stitch screws to make my way around the entire perimeter. I could have got by in this cosmetic application just with the initial four and we could have epoxied over the gap, textured it, blended it, been good because we're not structural here. We're not having to seal anything, but I wanted to make my way around the perimeter, erase that gap entirely anyhow. So you can see them all stacked up on each other in there. And there's plenty of different ways to do this. Uh, a more common method would have been to put two in with a gap and then zip the heads off, peen them in, and then bridge another one in the center, do that. You can, there's all kinds of ways to do it because this is about as low stakes as you can possibly get when it comes to stitching right here. This is just the method I chose because it's easiest. The screws that I'm using are just a low quality tapered head machine screw, all right? I just wanted something that was gonna be soft, malleable, easy to work, easy to cut threads in, will not give me any problems, so. I throw them in the lathe and I cut the taper off of the head. So we're just left with a plain slotted head screw. It does everything I need it to do. Um, a few problems though, it went well here, but along the bottom, there was four in a row where I ran into a very hard pocket of cast iron that was difficult to drill, almost impossible to tap. And when I prepped this side, I thought I had all of the hard material ground out because I had tested it with a file all around. Seemed all right. Well, after I got in about halfway through, I started hitting a hard pocket in there and I spent about as much time doing those four on the bottom as I did the whole rest of the perimeter, but we made it. So I think when I go to do this side, I am going to take even more material out. Generally, they say to go out about a quarter of an inch beyond an area that has been either torched like this or an area that's been heat damage from someone trying to arc weld without doing preheats and everything else. That's why I'm not even attempting any kind of a welder braze on this. I'm just not set up to do it. So we're gonna end up probably with a bit larger hole on this side, but um, it's more important to get all that hard stuff out of there and have good metal to work because I burned through five different taps last night putting those four of those last five in. And once you get dull taps, you're better off not even using them here because um, you need to be able to cut good threads down the side of the uh, screw next door. And if you broke a tap off in one of those harder sections cast, you've really created problems for yourself at that point. All right, we've dressed this side and nice and flush. I'm really well satisfied with it and an excellent match in texturing between the two types of cast iron as well. So there are two ways, two directions we can go with this right now. The most common would be to take a needle scaler to all of these freshly ground stitches and just rough them up and try to blend it that way. When I finished these with the Dremel, I actually grown them in a little bit. I wanted to have kind of a, a depression, a divot that went around there because I'm just going to leave it as it is. And when it comes time to paint, we'll throw some body filler over that. And I am pretty good at replicating a rough cast surface just by taking some aggressive grit sandpaper and just patting it, just going all around, just getting, transferring that, that rough texture in a random uh, manner. And 
I don't really even want to erase the texture of the cast here or in the center. I just want to blend it. So trust me on this. It's going to look funny until we get to that stage, but I can make that look like it never happened. That's been the goal this whole time. So that does it for the first side. And I don't know how much of the second side I'm going to show on camera because the camera really slows me down doing this type of work, but you can see the circle that I drew around that hole with the marker. That's our minimum that we're going to take out because I don't want to have to deal with any hard spots on this side at all. I'd rather make the hole bigger and have easier drilling and tapping. So we got some time left today. I'll just keep the camera rolling. We'll begin the prep for this side. Seems to be passing the file test all the way around, not detecting any more hard spots. We took it out quite a ways. And the process begins again. Well, everybody, we're near the end of another day. I want to show you the progress. I've got eight of them stitched in so far, and I am not regretting one bit grinding this one out farther to get rid of all of that hard cast from the heat damage. So far, these have just been sinking in one after another and no problems. I estimate I'm going to need about 21 of them to get around here. So comparable to the 19 that I put in on the other side. And you can see I left that leg long because I had to cut into that um, roll pin access hole that I still believe was there from the factory. I'm just going to uh, center this uh, under the end mill, round that back out once I get the patch in and everything else ground. So that's going to be a pretty easy thing to retain right there. So we're flushed out very well again too. I just... I love how well that cast matches in surface finish. Once we get some paint on that, you're never going to know that was even patched. So I think I'm going to call it an episode right here. Um, I'm going to split head inside and start throwing this together because if I upload it right now, I can get this out a full day sooner to y'all than I would if I tried to finish the job. And it's just going to be more repetition of me just drilling and tapping holes and putting plugs in, grind flush, smooth out. Once I get all that done, because you all know the routine by now, we can move on to uh, maybe getting that assembled for good and installed finally on top of the transmission also for good. So thank you again for watching everyone and hope to see you back again next time.